also in the election, CNN exit poll shows Republicans uh, won big among full-time workers and college attendees showing the youth are becoming more libertarian. And again, it was a libertarian movement. CNS News is reporting that breathed life into the dying dinosaur Republican carcass. So it's not an endorsement of the Republican establishment, this major political realignment. It's America waking up the collectivism and insider politics and, and identity politics and race politics is a fraud. And that's exactly what the new black senator, uh, Scott, is saying. Stop the race painting. And for that, he gets an F grade from the NAACP. <sighs> Pretty amazing to see all of that unfolding. Now, we've got a very special guest on, Stephen Hatfield, for the balance of the hour. Towards the end of the hour, we will take some calls from Joe and others that are calling in on Ebola uh, specifically. I don't say Ebola on purpose. It's a Freudian slip, Ebola. Stephen Hatfield is an American physician, virologist, and bioweapons expert, one of the top in the world, who underwent what was considered by many a trial by the media and with great toll in his personal and professional life after eight months of pressure from the media and amateur detectives, the U.S. Department of Justice identified the former government scientist as a person of interest in the investigation. That's not why he's on today. Uh, the 2001 attacks. He was later completely exonerated and Hatfield later sued uh, and uh, won $5.8 million from the federal government. They also tried to burn a bunch of other patsies. It was bizarre. And of course, we really know what happened with that. It, wasn't somebody rogue, ladies and gentlemen. We're not going to cover that much today. As of 2014, Stephen Hatfield uh, is consulting to African countries on Ebola containment and prevention. In his detailed report on Ebola epidemic made available by the Atlantic Monthly, he supports the, the uh, introduction of stronger quarantine measures to protect the United States from infection. So he's one of the global leading experts. He's worked a lot in Africa as well. He's advising the African countries, one of the top advisors to their governments. And so, again, we're very honored to have him join us and, and dovetail with all this. Forbes is reporting, and we're linked to it on Infowars.com, that Obama has ordered the media to cover up new Ebola cases or what they believe are Ebola cases in the country. And we've interviewed on air by name medical doctor and others, Border Patrol, that they're saying, no, people that we're told have Ebola are being disappeared. So it appears to be a cover up, but regardless, people are being disappeared. So we've got the expert on. Uh, to be able to break down every facet of this. Uh, and he's an associate of Doctors for Disaster Preparedness. They have an amazing website, DDP Online. That's DDP Online.org. We're going to tweet that out. But we have uh, one of the top doctors, one of the top global experts on Ebola, giving us the uh, inside breakdown on what's happening. Dr. Hadfield, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you very much, Alex. Good day to you. So much is happening. Uh, where should we begin? Probably to look at this entire outbreak. And by the way, there's, there, there are a lot of people knowledgeable about Ebola. Um, this disease has been recognized since 1975. And the earlier generation of infectious disease specialists that worked with us recognized that there was some non-understanding of this virus with respect to transmission or potential for transmission, and they classified this as a biosafety level four threat. This requires the highest level of biocontainment. This is where you wear the spacesuits that are under positive pressure, and you work inside a room that is negative pressure. So nothing can get to your skin or your mucous membranes, and you're quite safe under these type of conditions. Because of field expedience and requirements, Ebola in Africa is being treated as a biosafety level three. Sure, Doc, speak up just a little bit for us. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, Ebola in Africa is being treated as a biosafety level three infection, and uh, we're, we're doing the same uh, in this country under these protocols. There's still some things we don't know about the virus, which is a bit concerning. The crux of the problem is, is that as the human species has expanded, We've enroached onto natural areas throughout the world in our ever-increasing numbers.
And this leads to the whole concept of emerging infectious diseases. And we're getting almost one new infection that we haven't seen before in humans um, almost every year now. So the Ebola outbreak is just the tip of the problem. And it's been interesting to watch how the United States responded to this. Because I can guarantee you there's, there's worse things than Ebola out in nature that we don't have any idea about yet. So it's very important to make sure that we have a good public health service, robust, and it's able to handle these, these unusual types of dangerous outbreaks. Specifically, we've seen Army reports saying that in cold weather, Ebola is essentially airborne, can live on surfaces for weeks. Then we see the New York Times and CNN saying, oh, is it going airborne? Uh, reportedly, it would only be infectious for three or four days previously. Now they say it doesn't show up for 21, maybe 70 in sperm. From researching Ebola as being a top bioweapons expert who advises Africa, uh, you say we don't know much about this virus and that concerns you. We read about 300 plus mutations, different strains. What can you tell us, Dr. Hatfield, about this particular Ebola and why it appears to have spread uh, you know, to record numbers of people? Well, for the last, uh, uh, to answer your question directly and then expound upon it, uh, the data that I'm getting back to me is that this virus is replicating to a, to a very high level in humans, the, the, the uh, Zaire strain of Ebola that's part of the uh, present outbreak. Also, this is an RNA virus, and these are notoriously susceptible to mutation. With respect to the aerosol transmission, we've known for four years now that both Ebola and its relative, the Marburg virus, uh, can survive in an aerosol in the dark uh, to detectable levels for at least one and a half hours. That is, if it's not in direct sunlight. Um, aerosols are generated by a variety of things, coughing, sneezing, invasive medical procedures, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, flushing a toilet, uh, a lot of common laboratory equipment that's used in a medical laboratory. Uh, these are capable of producing aerosol droplets in different size ranges. Um, in traditional outbreaks of Ebola in Africa, airborne transmission has not been uh, an overwhelming feature. It's been person-to-person -person contact or contact with uh, contaminated fluids. When we're in the United States, and an ambulance crew is trying to transport a patient with an unknown fever uh, to a hospital. Uh, it's very common to generate aerosols and vomit and this type of thing. And, and my concern is, is patients that don't realize they have this disease or EMS responders that don't realize they have this. And then secondary um, um, transmission to, to the health care worker. Well, Dr. Stephen Hatfield is our guest, one of the top bioweapons experts uh, out there, and he's advising African countries on what's going on. We see some UN models saying 1.4 million by January uh, that could contract it. I, I know you've called for, for you know, stricter controls. Uh, I follow the news, but I'm not an expert like you, but I do interview the experts, doctor. Previously, they would put people on ships or you know, make them get out of the hot zone in Africa for 21 days before they brought them in. They wouldn't stick Ebola patients, like you said, with level four inside hospitals, level two or three. Uh, why are they not doing the default things they did previously? A, B, why are they lying to people and saying there's no threat it'll spread over here? Or, or am I wrong about that? What do you think, pulling back from this as a scientist, just as an American citizen, as a, as a family man, Things don't seem right here. Well, what's really going on? I don't know. It seems politics are driving things. Now, this epidemic in Africa is, I think, I don't think we're going to see these catastrophic uh, predictions over there. Good. We have a very good infrastructure here. I mean, you can't imagine the conditions in Africa in some places. So the ability to uh, control this thing uh, here, I think, is very, very good. This, is, this isn't the one to panic about. But it does portray some disturbing questions. Uh, we've spent $120 billion on biological defense and emerging diseases over the last two decades. Um, and we can't see. 
seem to handle one case of Ebola. Uh, flu is probably our really biggest worry, uh, an avian hybrid flu. And for this, um, the uh, United States, uh, spent some $47 million in supplemental funding to the Department of uh, Health and Human Services. In a recent GAO investigation, uh, it's, it's essentially this money was wasted. Uh, DHS spent about $9.5 million on protective equipment since 2006, and 6 .7 for antiviral drugs, which, by the way, uh, don't work. And uh, our stockpile of, of Tamiflu and the other, other drug has expired. There's been no controls to monitor. There was no rationality to this purchasing. They bought uh, about 5,000 bottles of hand sanitizer. 84% of this has expired. So uh, basically a giant boondoggle. Yeah, essentially. Stay there. Dr. Stephen Hatfield is our guest, MD, one of the top bioweapons experts out there. When I come back, I want to ask him then if he talks about an airborne avian flu that's airborne to humans, that being the big threat. What are the big threats? Mouse pox. Uh, he talks about all these new emerging diseases. Let's discuss that because what this shows us is when something really bad shows up, they're just going to leave the borders wide open. And why? This winter, next to water and food, you need a safe, storable fuel supply for your preparedness needs. Spare fuel is the answer. Unlike gasoline, spare fuel can be safely stored with your other supplies for many years and works in any gas-powered vehicle or backup generator. With the bitterly cold temperatures predicted for this winter, now is the best time to stock up on spare fuel. So, go to GetSpareFuel.com. That's GetSpareFuel.com. GetSpareFuel.com. In today's unstable environment, self-protection is critical. Civil unrest, riots, looting, it's happening now, right here in the United States. And your rights are at risk. If passed, H.R. 5344 would ban Level 3 and above body armor. Katie Armor is standing up for you. We offer the most affordable Level 3 body armor on the market. Katie Level 3 armor withstands pistol and rifle hits up to 762 NATO. Get yours at katiearmor.com. That's C-A-T-I armor.com. Katie Armor, come and take it. On September 30th, 2014, the first confirmed case of Ebola appeared in the U.S. This combined with several other unidentified viruses have some of our customers at 30dayfoodsupply.com concerned about the safety of our domestic food supply, resulting in a surge of our $99.90 serving kits. While we at 30dayfoodsupply.com have no expertise in epidemiology, we are aggressively purchasing raw materials that are currently in stock and we intend to continue to sell our 30-day non-GMO emergency food supply for only $99 as long as we can. Oregon Trail Foods and 30dayfoodsupply.com keep prices low by buying directly from the producers in Oregon and then pass the savings on to you. Call 541-229-0010 and purchase our 30-day, 90-day serving emergency food supplies for only $99 and $10 ships your entire order to the lower 48. Visit our website at 30dayfoodsupply.com or call 541-229-0010. 541-229-0010. What good is a Big Berkey water filter? We get that question a lot here at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. And in a word, the answer is protection. Protection from water main breaks, E. coli contamination, environmental chemical spills, pesticide runoff, chlorine taste and smell, and all forms of fluoride. Plus, Big Berkey water filters are the original gravity water filter system and most trusted on the market for a reason. Tested by multiple independent NSF EPA certified labs, they are the gold standard in water purification. At only 1.7 cents a gallon, a single set of filters filters can last for five to ten years. That means big savings. Big Berkey, the one that's powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water. Get a Big Berkey today at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit our website or call 1-877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-BERKEY. Big Berkey Water Filters, for the love of clean water. Hi folks, Alex Jones here with some important information. I want to tell you about Matt Redhawk and his team of patriots over at My Patriot Supply. 
Several years ago, Matt was sitting in his two-bedroom apartment, frustrated with the direction this country was headed, and the charlatans willing to sell us out for a quick buck. Deciding to take action, a company run by Patriots for Patriots was born. My Patriot Supply has never taken a loan or accepted outside funding. They now operate two distribution facilities and employ over 50 hardworking American men and women. It is rare to find companies who practice what they preach. And that's why I stock my pantry with high quality storable foods from My Patriot Supply. Go to mypatriotsupply.com forward slash Alex today for special offers on emergency food storage or call their preparedness specialist at 866-229-0927. That's 866-229-0927. Do business with someone who shares your values. Mypatriotsupply.com slash Alex. Don't worry, this show is documented. Alex Jones on the GCN Radio Network. I fell into a burning ring. That's right, don't worry. We start what claiming something or talking about something, we give you the source about 99% of the time. Or over speculate, and we'll tell you, we're just speculating. You can make the decision yourself, just like we're doing, off what you think's going on. Dr. Stephen Hatfield is our guest, medical doctor, uh, one of the top bioweapons experts out there on record. And you can read big articles with his analysis in the Atlantic Monthly, you name it, just by Googling his name or going to ddponline.org, Doctors for Disaster Preparedness. Uh, and he joins us right now. We'll be taking some of your calls coming up for him at 800-259-9231, 800-259-9231, coming up in the next segment. Doc, this is your short segment, so getting right back into it. I see them publish the design of mouse pox that they say is super deadly, worse than Ebola, correct me if I'm wrong. Or uh, universities openly working at BioShield uh, to you know, create new airborne avian flu, claiming they want to know how to treat it. But I, again, I'm no uh, rocket scientist or virologist like you, but it seems if you've got level four stuff going on uh, in Galveston you know, where it gets hit by a hurricane and... Things seem so flimsy now. It's only a matter of time till the bio shield system ends up releasing some nightmare pathogen. Or do you think it's going to come out of the jungles of somewhere? You talk about all these emerging things. What is the big threat? What keeps you awake at night? Yeah, you know, Mother Nature. Yeah. Look, these these labs. I mean, you've got C.J. Peters down there, and he is probably one of the world's experts on Ebola. Um, he was at CDC Special Pathogens for years. You Sam read an uh, extremely, extremely knowledgeable scientist and physician, uh, just a wonderful guy. And this stuff isn't getting out of a lab. Uh, okay, so you're not worried about that. What are you? No. So, so you're worried about the jungle. I'm worried about the jungle. And right now, there's about five different things going on with emerging diseases. We have this enterovirus that's sickening the children in the Midwest. We have monkeypox outbreaks in the Kasai Oriental province. This has been going on for years. We have an Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We have the MERS virus in the Mideast. This is a severe respiratory system virus uh, semi-related to the SARS virus that broke out in China and Hong Kong. We have the chikungunya virus outbreak, and it's, it's almost epidemic in Puerto Rico. We've had, I think, one primary case in Florida and one secondary mosquito-transmitted cases in Florida. So uh, these things are just, as our species numbers increase, we have more contact with disrupted, fragmented environments, and most of these diseases are jumping from animals into humans. A number of years ago, in the mid-90s, we almost lost all the lions in the Serengeti in Africa. Distemper, a uh, type of measles virus, jumped from the uh, local wild dogs into the lion population and, and decimated them. So this is an continuing, growing threat of emerging infectious diseases, and scientists have been worried about this for 30 years. So as humans move into these zoological areas, uh, and well, what's caused...
causing the viruses and things to jump over into other animals and humans? Is it just the proximity? The proximity and the fact that the majority of these are RNA viruses. RNA is a type of genetic information that a virus carries. Uh, the other type is the DNA, which a lot of people are familiar with. But in an RNA virus, every time the virus replicates, it tends to make a mistake in its genetic copy. So you have, a whole, with, let's say, HIV, HIV, a retrovirus, something a bit different, but you may find up to 27 different strains of HIV in one patient. Wow. So it's Mother Nature's way. And as these viruses mutate, many become non-infectious. Many lose their capability for viability. Some acquire perhaps new traits. Uh, the, arrest, the Ebola restin virus is completely non-pathogenic for humans. You can inject this into yourself and you won't even run a temperature. It, it does nothing. But it's very, very aerosol transmitted. Now, if you're a pig, it makes you sick. A lot of these are very species-specific. And then the pig transmits the rest of the Ebola virus to humans, and again, nothing happens. So sometimes there's an amplifying host in the middle. Let me ask you a question when we come back, long segment coming up. Is it possible when it goes through a buffer like a pig, would you then get some immunity to other Ebola viruses from the Reston uh, v v uh, variety? And we'll ask, is that the one that got out in the lab in 1989? We'll be back. Stay with us. Stephen Hatfield is our guest, uh, one of the top bioweapons experts out there, advising major African governments on this uh, biggest Ebola outbreak ever. And talking about the response, if you just joined us, I'm your host, Alex Jones. I want us to go to some phone calls now in the 10, 15 minutes we've got left uh, with uh, Stephen Hadville. And, of course, you can visit his website, uh, Doctors for Disaster Preparedness, that he's part of, ddponline.org for doctors and others. Then we'll be part of the organization to get the latest up-to-date information. You can go there and become a member as well. has a lot of important news and information as well. Looking at this... What is, you know, the FBI had asked major universities to, to not release, uh, I guess, the way to weaponize uh, mousepox and things like this. You talk about monkeypox and things. Obviously, there have been weaponized things in government labs around the country. South Africa came out in some of their hearings, was trying to weaponize things for race-specific reasons. Uh, I know a lot of that stuff's classified. But specifically, are you worried about that more? Uh, you know, in the Russians and the Cold War with weaponized anthrax, or are you worried more about what's coming out of the jungle uh, merging with something? I mean, could we see something th that 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 makes airborne Ebola look tame? A twelve uh, monkey scenario? Uh, yeah, I just want to finish the answer to my skin shedding. Yes, we don't know when during infection this occurs. The the things that were looked at were late, you know, almost terminal cases. But we don't have data on when, when skin shedding occurs, and if you're infected through the skin, uh, the virus would be replicating there. So, I mean, what I'm trying to say is there's still some uncertainties here. So when we develop first responder guidelines, we always need to err on the side of caution. I get it. So we need to tell the firemen, the police, the medical workers, as you wrote uh, in the Atlantic, uh, that they could get it by brushing up against somebody. What I can say is this. Medicine Sans Frontier, MSF, probably have the greatest number of people experienced with handling Ebola. They're, they're, they've been absolutely heroic in their efforts in Africa. On their own guidelines, their handbook for handling these patients, uh, the degree for a risk for accidental exposures in the unclear or variable section of their degrees of risk, they mention direct contact between intact skin. And an example touched by a symptomatic Ebola patient. And their guidelines were immediate observation at the field or at the national capital level of, of these instances. So we know patients in advanced stages um, and this is part of the transmission, handling the bodies, uh, burying the bodies without proper protective gear and this type of thing. These
these are late cases, but we don't have data to indicate when this viral shedding starts. So we're assuming it's in late stage cases. Well, assuming is not erring on the side of caution. So we need further studies on this. Sure, well, all these Texas officials and federal officials said there's no way to get it. You have to be vomited on into an open wound. That's been showed not to be true. And clearly, it looks like this Ebola is hardier, spreading more than ever before. So something's going on here. I, um, I want to go to these callers, John, Justin, Mike, Jake, and others uh, that are patiently holding. But, uh, Doc, what about uh, bio... I'm more, I'm more worried about the jungle. To answer your, your question before this, there are things out there. There's a, a virus called the Bass Congo virus. Time from death between first showing symptoms is two to three days. There's only been about three or four cases. Wow. We don't know a lot about this. There's another virus that hasn't jumped species yet. It's still in the monkeys called simian hemorrhagic fever. And this has 100% lethality in, in, in monkeys. Wow. Now, it hasn't jumped to humans yet, and we're trying to watch this. But Mother Nature is, is really not something you want to mess with. It requires the highest sort of thinking on this and always erring on the side of caution when you're dealing with human lives. Now, now what was the virus that kills 100%? Well, it's a monkey virus that hasn't jumped into humans that we know of yet. It's called simian hemorrhagic yes. fever. And then what was the other one that's only a few people have gotten it, but it kills them in a matter of days? It's called the BAS, B-A-S, dash Congo virus. Wow, and imagine if those got out. Well, we don't know how it's trained. It looks like it's probably, again, the, the, the fruit bats. But, you know, we're not certain yet. It might be arthropod. You know, insect transmitted, we, we don't know, and there's still a lot of research going on on this. But it serves as an example that Mother Nature holds a lot of surprises for us. And, I mean, right now we live in a virtual sea of viruses. We can't see them, we can't detect them, we can't smell them, we can't touch them, but they're all around us. Only a few, only about 1,700 infectious agents have the capacity to affect humans. But any time they could mutate, and then there'll be a chain reaction, and we're not ready at all. Seems like the more money we spend, the less ready we are. It's bizarre. Yeah, uh, I think so. Yeah. Bizarre. Dr. Stephen Hatfield uh, is uh, here with us today. Uh, let's take some phone calls. Uh, John in North Carolina, thanks for being patient. You're on the air. Uh, hi. Yeah, I had a couple of questions for Stephen Hatfield. Yeah, you're on the air. Uh, yeah, Stephen, um, can you tell us what you were doing uh, in North Carolina back in November of 2001? No. <laughs> well, we don't screen the phone calls, but I, I mean, obviously, uh, but that I think was a, that was a classified project. Yeah. Oh, so you were in North Carolina in 2001. Can you tell us specifically what you were doing in Clayton, North Carolina, 2001? Right, well, I didn't set this call up, and I don't mind the call. No, I don't either. I don't remember being in Clayton, North Carolina. Where I saw you, you walked down my street. You were wearing your army jacket, which had your last name on it. You remember uh, that? No. That's, uh, you're thinking of somebody else. I got another question for you. you. Back in those days, you admitted that you had killed a terrorist and kept his shoes as a souvenir. Can you tell us who that was? Is this an FBI agent calling in or something? <laughs> no, this is Stephen Hatfield's victim. Okay. Uh, listen, I, l l listen, here's the deal. The FBI went after like four or five people. He's won a lawsuit. He wasn't involved in the anthrax attacks, folks. I studied them. We have a prime suspect uh, that was never gone after who was checked into the area where it was at. Uh, and uh, we don't screen phone calls. I'm trying to get in a fight with the no, caller. No, no, that, that's okay. I, w I was in the Rhodesian Army. Uh, I don't know the terrorist's name. It was in Mozambique. Uh, the man was carrying a weapon, and he was coming across the border to brutalize innocent tribes people. You've done a lot of interesting things. We ought to get you on sometime just about your life. Years ago, I did have you on separately about the whole anthrax deal. You probably don't even remember that. No. But uh, uh, you don't do a ton of interviews these days, but you are doing more, I guess, to respond to what's happening with Ebola. I, I wasn't even going to go there <coughs> with the anthrax case, but they later admitted that, it, that you just had zero connection, and it was quackery. And I don't even want to name names here, but it just literally 
just got you got fingered because you were one of the people advising the government on anthrax and and, and so you were just a name they picked out of a hat well, actually i wasn't advising the government on anthrax we were training them yeah. we were helping to teach the domestic preparedness program well that's was, what i meant like how to counter things like that well for the hospitals in the 120 largest cities how to handle some sort of an outbreak but uh Anthrax was just one of the agents. There was tularemia, um, plague, the, the plague organism, uh, a virus called VEE, and some others. But this was this was just um, a national program that the non luger Domenici Amendment had brought into place. Well, that was a bizarre call. I mean, I would have kept him on, but when people start, you know, saying I'm a victim, I don't know how I can prove that. If that person wants to send me proof or information, I'd like to see it. Maybe Mr. Hatfield will come back on and debate you. But we got him on today about Ebola. I would have told him up front if he was coming on about anthrax, but people, people sure want to know about that. Have you ever thought about writing a book about the whole anthrax debacle? Oh, yeah, I wrote one. I mean, I know you wrote one, but have you thought about writing one about now since it all, you know, came out? I wrote one during the time. In fact, I think I read that book. What was the name of no, it? No, I haven't published it. <laughs> it must have been a book about the anthrax attacks. You know, it, 14 it, it, years goes by, you forget a lot of stuff. It might have been. Look, I'm used to this, so this isn't a problem. This, this happens all the time still. Once you're named a person of interest, uh, that never goes away. It continues. Well, look. Until the day you die. If something happens in Austin now, a city of two million people, yeah. the, the uh, folks online say, I must be involved. Uh, I, I mean, it just goes on and on. <laughs> uh, let's talk to Justin in Texas. Justin, you're on the air. Yes. Hey, Alex. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, shout out and props to all the guys on your staff. Everybody's doing an excellent job. Thank you, brother. Uh, and we miss you here in Corpus Christi. It's been a while. So I'd just like to touch base on a on something. I'm, I'm in my 30s, and I can tell that there's a lot of people in the same age bracket that have concerns and, like, what they're able to do and what they can't do and what they can get away with and the legalities of this. And right now, um, I, I read an article recently about Operation American Freedom. It might be a spinoff of the Operation American uh, Spring, if you remember that. Sure, that's specifically on how to get politically active. Do you have a question for our guest? Well, not so much for the guest, but I'm just curious what we can do. We, uh, there's a lot. Oh, well, of I'm going to put you on hold and come back to you because we're talking about Ebola right now. Uh, let's go ahead and talk to Mike in Wyoming. Mike, you're on the air. So, uh, Mr. Hatfield, you would have us believe that it's just serendipity that these Ebola outbreaks are occurring in areas that are rich in oil, gas, gold, diamonds, uh, that it's, it's, the virus is just jumping species. And, and how are we to reconcile your comments with uh, those of uh, Dr. Francis Boyle about a week ago where he said that uh, my album out of UTMB Galveston, uh, Tulane, CDC are all working at weaponizing Ebola? Well, the Soviets tried for years to weaponize Ebola, and they couldn't stabilize it. What they did do was they managed to weaponize one of its relatives called the Marburg virus, which they made quite a bit of. In response to why are these outbreaks occurring in environmentally rich and mineral-rich areas, well, these areas happen to be in areas that we call high biodiversity. And there's about 12 biomes scattered throughout the world. And if you look at the number of conflicts, wars, that have occurred, about 80% of these since 1953 have occurred in these stressed high biodiversity areas. And when you stress these biodiversity areas, i.e. fragment the jungle, have human enroachment to the edge of the jungle, uh, destroy natural food sources, this type of thing for the animals, this is where you start to see these viruses jump out. Sure. One argument is, is that South Africa was trying to develop uh, weaponized airborne Ebola and other things. We've played some of those clips here from the news. And, and I think what uh, Mike's getting into here is we've had a lot of experts on pointing out that the U.S. is using this outbreak as a cover to send in AFRICOM to take over the resources. The Chinese are sending thousands of people. No, that's... That, that, no, I don't put anything above the Chinese. 
Chinese, but the United States, the, the, and it's a humanitarian thing. The soldiers that are going over are from a transport battalion. They're going over very bravely. I, I don't know what level of training they receive uh, or self-protection against the virus, but they're going over there very bravely because their country asks them to. To well, it is true. They know the, I think they've got five hours training, so they're certainly uh, not uh, combat groups. Uh, but but folks are looking at that. I know you've got to go. If you can do five more minutes with us, I want to come back and talk about the organization uh, that you're part of, ddponline.org. That's a great question, caller. This is GCN, the Genesis Communications Radio Network. General, what do you think about the FBI saying that there's a terror alert on Monday about a potential Fort Hood situation? The police are shoving people, shoving Alex, shoving the crowd. Here we go, folks. I'm being assaulted. Whether it's the radio show, the news websites, documentary films, or the nightly news, InfoWars is the tip of the spear. Is this another false flag stage attack to take our civil liberties and put more homeland security by sticking their hands down on the pants on the streets? It's up to us to set brush fires in the minds of men and women everywhere. And that's what PrisonPlanet.tv is designed. Designed to do. You watch the Assad regime is going to be blamed or accused of using chemical weapons against the so-called rebels. What we see now is a war against reality. It's a war against the truth. It's more vital than ever that supporters of freedom become members of PrisonPlanet.tv and share their membership with up to 11 friends and family. Visit InfoWarsNews.com today. Become a member, share your membership, and help take the InfoWar to the next level. You're listening to The Alex Jones Show. Big Brother. Mainstream media. Government cover-ups. You want answers? Well, so does he. He's Alex Jones on the GCN Radio Network. And now, live from Austin, Texas, Alex Jones. We're going to take a few more calls real quick for our guest. He's got to go, but we'll have him back sometime to talk about his life and all the interesting things he's done. Uh, Dr. Stephen Hatfield. I read a book about him years ago. Very interesting guy. I forget the book's title, but it was... Uh, so that's why I was thinking I'd read his book, but he hasn't published yet. He should put it out. Uh, very interesting fellow. DDPonline.org. He's on the board of it. Doctors for Disaster Preparedness. Tell us about DDPonline.org. Um, I ran into this organization through a friend. And I really don't join anything, but I, I had a look at them. They're a bit controversial, but there were some very well-known scientists on... Uh, on uh, their list, and DDP has sort of, for the last several years, um, really been looking at the data on uh, uh, man-made caused global warming, and some really distinguished people, Fred Singer, uh, Dr. Fred Singer, Dr. Willie Soon, uh, you know, some very, very... Uh, established scientists. And slowly, I, I went, I, went uh, I forget what I talked on the first time I was asked to give the presentation. And uh, I, I went to another meeting, and uh, I started looking at the evidence for man-made caused global warming myself, and uh, it was quite an eye-opener. <laughs> if you look at the actual scientific data, and how the politics have become involved, and how people just accepted that, well, yes, uh, man-made CO2 production was the... Anyway, I don't want to get into the climate debate, but... But, I, but, I, but I, I mean, I, bottom line, is man-made global warming uh, happening? Well, the guy that started the Weather Channel, a very distinguished meteorologist, says it's not due to man. Of course, it's, pure, it's the sun... And if we didn't have carbon dioxide, we'd all be dead. We're having some great variabilities and unexpected things in our solar cycle with the, the amount of energy the sun Yeah, it's the sun. Out. It's the sun. Yeah. No, no matter what the U.N. says. We're, I mean, yeah. I'm not a top virologist, but, but I, I know it's the sun. I'm not either, and I don't want to get into that. But I enjoyed the, the fact that silent scientists were challenging 
government statements based on the science. And I thought, wow, this is this is something I'd like so to do. So it's a great organization. Scientists and others and should get involved with it. Uh, let's take one final call quickly. Denise in Texas. I'll get to others after he goes. Denise, real quick question for Dr. Hatfield. Yes, sir. What can I do to help? Uh, if I call the senator, what can I tell the senator to help? Well, I go ahead like Lowell. I mean, you know, doctors and people say we should have more of a quarantine, right, Doc? Well, that's my opinion. Um, there's going to be a Senate hearing, I think, on the November 11th, where they're pulling in. Uh, and, and, and don't lay everything at the, at the feet of the poor CDC director. He inherited a lot of this. Uh, uh, there's going to be some people that are head of bureaucracies being called up to the Hill uh, to answer questions from your elected representatives. So if you had a particular question or something you want to, by all means, how it works in this country is you contact your elected representative and tell them you have a question they would like to be asked during sure. that hearing. And cross your fingers and see if they ask it. Well, Doc, I know this. There's clearly an attempt to shut down Ebola news and to cover it up. That's why we're watching it so closely. Thank you so much for the time. And that's Doctors for Disaster Preparedness, ddponline.org. Dr. Stephen Hatfield, thank you so much. I hope you'll come back on sometime to talk about that book you haven't published and your, uh, your, <laughs> what you've done in your life. It's pretty interesting. If, if I manage to stay alive in Africa, I will. <laughs> oh, so you're about to go to Africa. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, let us talk to you when you come back. All right, we'll think about that. All right, thank you very much. Okay, sir. Bye. There he goes. All right, we're going to come back, get to other calls. You had questions, but you can speak to Ebola. Then we'll open it back up on election news. And we're just giving you different perspectives on Ebola from different well-known experts, okay? We'll be right back. Stay with us.